Hi, everyone. This week will be the last lecture. Um, I have decided to uh, take uh, the last week of class as you have all your final projects done, um, the lecture on uh, alcohol abuse down. We're still going to have presentations um, from uh, the presenting group so we can make sure to support them as they uh, get their points for that uh, work, but I just thought it would be a nice thing for you and also for me as I get ready to uh, put together uh, the time to look through all the final papers and projects. So um, I'm excited. This is our last uh, lecture. You've done a great job hanging in there. Um, so let's talk about the media. Again, social problems has been hitting areas that have escalated in our thought processes uh, due to COVID-19 and the experience that we are going through. I don't know how many of you have been uh, online, uh, but I bet you you've been online uh, considerably more. The percentage of uh, work that you're asked just through education to be online, including YouTube, is uh, something that um, we are giving thanks for in a lot of ways so that we can continue our classes, but then we also have concerns um, about how people are connecting. So what is the media? It's a different technological process that has lots of different ways to facilitate communication between the sender of the message and the receiver of the message. That would be our sociological definition of the function. The media as a whole is difficult to uh, explain as it continues to develop over time and different forms of media have uh, different platforms. And so we have to be aware that we're constantly expanding this definition. It's been blamed for directing, creating and promoting social problems, which I think we have uh, experienced in our discussions uh, prior to just talking about the media. And it's been accused of things like content, where do we get the images, and it includes things like violence and reifying racism and sexism. Also, it's a highly controlled process with dissemination uh, coming from professionals most of the time, even though there may be ways in which we get our news from different personal uh, platforms and places that we support. Typically, the media is the institutionalized and professionalized and sometimes state-run uh, control of information. It creates an unequal advantage is also something that has been accused of, of certain social groups. Let's look at the three theories uh, that we've been looking at throughout the semester to see how media is viewed. First, the functionalist perspective would say that it examines the structural relationship between the media and other social institutions, meaning the media is kind of a check and balance of other institutions trying to help people disseminate the information that they're getting, especially in large populations and in mass society where we are now, again, I bring this up all the time, 7.4 billion people trying to process what we are doing as people and how we're organizing. So if you look at the little uh, set of circles to the left, it talks about the ways in which correlation, mobilization, validation, surveillance, <laughs> sensationalism, transmission, entertainment, that's something you're filtering all the time. And the functionalists would say that that is a way we feel like we're connected through social glue. The media serves as a link also to individuals and communities and nations to help us as a whole feel a collective consciousness a term which Emil Durkheim described as a set of shared norms and beliefs in society. And so we go back to our early uh, sociologists and, and kind of can see the, the way that even though we may see differing views, we definitely see a sense of being connected to people, some that we don't even know face to face uh, because of the media. And therefore, conflict perspective comes into line uh, because a lot of times there's media bias and you find yourself landing on a scale or some sort of a spectrum based on what you listen to, what you pay attention to, what you validate as true. It's uh, some uh, lenses uh, in the conflict perspective especially point out uh, the disparities of women and minorities not being fairly represented in the media, especially when we talk about imaging and stories. So it would say, uh, and a lot of times this is from a Marxist perspective, the media serves the interest of the state and corporate powers to support ruling elite and limits the variety of messages we read, see, and hear. Also, the news divisions of the media are cartels in lots of ways. When we talk about cartel, we often think about the cartel of drugs, but what a cartel is, is it's very similar to a monopoly, except monopolies 
often are uh, autonomous and need to be broken up, which we'll talk a little bit later because that did happen with the media industry uh, about 20 years ago. Um, but that these cartels are all competing for your attention, your uh, viewpoint being shaped by them and the actions that will cause in our public policy and life. Media will also be uh, criticized by the conflict theory as a consolidation that has resulted in just 10 media conglomerates, a change that many view with distrust. Some examples of this is uh, a 2008 study found that Spanish language news outlets generated a larger volume of immigration coverage than English language outlets. That was Brant, Brant and Dunaway uh, that talked very clearly about how immigration is presented. And um, we've talked a little bit about that two weeks ago when we were looking at uh, work in the economy. Actually, that might have been, no, that was two weeks ago based on when this, this is being presented. Um, English language, also news media were more likely to focus on negative aspects of immigration and the Spanish language media outlets did not and sometimes even had a positive light of that immigration uh, narrative. And uh, both patterns are motivated by profit and the desire to satisfy different target audiences. The feminist perspective is also another lens that we've been looking back and forth throughout the semester. And it's important in media for us to recognize, again, feminism is uh, none of us are free until all of us are free kind of mentality, which isn't just about representation of women in media, it's representation of people that are other than those who are mostly represented, which typically in the US is white male. Um, of a certain social status. So feminist perspective will say it attempts to understand how media represents de and devalues women and minorities. It's also utilizing stereotypes, disparaging women and minorities of completely um, different uh, forms of being controlled and excluding them in the media images by uh, continually displaying them in a particular way. More feminized forms of pop culture, such as female action heroines, are also coming onto the screen. And so this is something feminist perfect perspectives will uh, celebrate. For example, think of how many female characters you have seen on Netflix series or Jessica Jones or Killing Eve, these kinds of things that we watch. We have seen a higher representation of that. And that also means that we probably have more producers and more, more folks trying to get us at that from that perspective. In the news media, we do have anchors and, and those types of things, but it's also what type of person are they representing again and what socioeconomic status, which is very important. Also feminist scholarship demonstrates how media undermines women, particularly taking uh, their body shapes and making them look at weak. For example, Hillary Clinton was highly sexualized uh, during her election, a lot of times try, people would point out the weakness against, you know, can we have a female as a uh, president rather than can we have a person who believes this and does this as a president and equally is a person. We also saw this happen in sports with Serena uh, Williams when she got mad, uh, suddenly the media per made her look like this. Um, highly angry tribal woman, which I won't even show that image anymore. It's so offensive. Uh, but it does point out that the body and the female body in that way is uh, put into roles of put in, being put into their place to stay at home and or not display anger. Interactionist perspectives would say that the top stories are what we have to watch. What is the symbol of a top story? What are the messages and the reality that we are seeing based on the media that is presented to us and how do we find it? Mass media defines what is newsworthy, of course. We sometimes are interactionist enough to figure out or you know, media literate enough to say, hey, I'm not sure I understand that. Let's go Snopes that, let's go figure that out. Um, sometimes we have to check in with our friends, what are they saying? And so, uh, that interactionist perspective means, okay, I saw this, what is somebody I trust saying about this? Um, which is hard work. It's a lot of emotional labor. And so interactionists would say, we're doing much emotional labor uh, than when we used to just read a newspaper that we knew the person down the road that wrote the article, that kind of thing. 
mass media also helps us shape public agenda and it's influencing the way people think about the world or what's happening outside of them and also it can help us consider social problems we've never had access to or thought of and so what what is that that uh, we notice going on with that type of interaction there's also a way in which the interactionists ex expose disproportionate coverage of crime and violence in news and media, which is going to be talked about um, in one of our presentations this week, um, and also how there's a lot of times um, people assume there's, you know, a certain type that fits into the idea of murderer, and yet we don't see a lot of times the statistics point a lot of times to different types of murders, different types of homicide that aren't covered. They're, um, unless they're sensationalized and the type of person and the, again, the socioeconomic status and often race and ethnicity. Um, it's important for us to watch those interactions and see what it's doing. A major issue we deal with is the loss of privacy as we continue to see media be digitalized and also part of our everyday life in the palm of our hand. Um, Irving Goffman would talk about impression man management as one of the ways in which we present ourselves. And so we're constantly presenting ourselves as, I mean, all of us are stars, right? <laughs> all of us are wanting to be liked. All of us are wanting our perspective to be out there. That was not the norm. You only had to do that face to face and or on paper if necessary, not too long ago. And when we started to see the smartphone take hold, um, even prior to the smartphone, we definitely had presentation of self um, on forms of media, such as, you know, people being in chat rooms and things like that. But it's a very different piece when you talk about the whole image and also how people alter their image so that they may look a particular way or they don't have facial blemishes or they just are having fun with it. Like, you know, I do sticking little stickers on things. So what we get out of that is a blurred public and private self through social media, and we are always processing that. And that control of our personal information then is also compromised. People are looking at us based on what we post, and this is why a lot of times in professional um, settings, a lot of times we'll say keep two different personal and uh, then also public presentations of self so that you, you can monitor that, which again is a lot of emotional labor. Edward Snowden also leaked NSA documents that confirmed that the agency was intercepting calls um, and online communication. So that's another loss of privacy. When we talk about loss of privacy, it's loss of privacy of ourselves to people we know or don't know, but there's also to agencies and institutions. And that was something that I think all of us kind of thought in the, you know, when we do this action of posting something that we know goes out there into the cyberverse that we ourselves might have somebody looking into that that isn't um, you know having our interests in mind other than to spy on us and so that came to fruition in that news story that once again was a top story websites routinely track personal information as you've seen algorithms it's been funny um, as mitch and i uh, look at things that we click on and then turn to facebook and immediately there's an ad and i know you've run through that too um, it's it's a little uh scary it goes into that risk society idea of how much are you willing to give up uh, as far as your privacy when it gains certain types of security um, and or feeling like you have choice um, when you go in and, and make uh, certain inquiries or talk to people or click something. Facebook has also come under uh, fire for that and we continually see that in the media um, as Zuckerberg is brought to trial and um, often um, publicly criticized even on Facebook um, for the amount of privacy that uh, we do not have on uh, that site and how we have to take care of that and manage it. The other thing we have to recognize is the digital divide, the disparities between the haves and have nots, which has been a major concern since we've gone online. There are people that had not any access to the same levels of digital connection um, when we went online. And we had, as you remember, I did a survey to see if you were able to get online somewhere <laughs> at a high level. And I felt very good about where most people were at. Um, 
and trying to create spaces where you could see this on YouTube rather than have to connect online and all of us crash or something like that. So that's something that's on the forefront of education and other places right now. But we have to recognize it, it does exist. The separating of individuals based on forms of technology that they do or don't have, it implies a chain of causality, lack of access, certain parts of the country, certain urban areas, rural areas. Those who are already marginalized in society have fewer opportunities to access that. And, and so we have to take a lot of um, precautions just to make sure that we're caring for everybody equally. Um, and the symptom of the larger social problem, which is inequality, is based on income, educational attainment, and ethnicity and race. And why wouldn't that show up in our media and digital world? As of 2016, 47% of the world's population is on the internet, which is a large number, but not everybody. Nearly 40% of all adults living in poverty are cellular-only users compared with 21% of adults with higher incomes. And they often have pay-as-you-go plans that have improved in access um, and been easier, but they were also seen as a social stigma if you had those kind of phones. Um, and so it's important to recognize that um, we label when it's hard to tell sometimes whether a person has a phone like that or not. But if you find out about that, you suddenly might make a uh, type of um, label attached to that person of somebody not being able to actually buy into a plan that you constantly pay on every month in a different way or even have the type of phone that's needed. Other barriers include lack of local relevant information, lack of basic literacy level, lack of non-English information, and also I would say lack of, of internet speed. <laughs> I mean that's a big piece for a lot of people. A lot of people in sociology ask the question, is media controlling our lives? Do we suddenly not read anymore or do we not uh, pay attention to other cognitive forms other than the media? And we call this internet abuse and addiction, the excessive use of non-productive use on the inter internet. And again, non-productive might mean different things to people. Um, being an interactionist, I'd be interested sometimes in what you'd think about that. Um, YouTube use, for example, 2 billion views a day, Tumblr, 4.5 million posts a day. Uh, this, I think, was 2017 when this was uh, taken. 5.5 million on tweets, Facebook, 500 million users um, a day. All of this is important for us, and that's, I'm sure, gone up uh, considerably uh, since we've all been um, I mean, I know of many people that got on internet at a higher rate, um, just on Facebook, so that they could um, do church work and that weren't necessarily as representative. Um, so that's important for us to, to recognize that there are ways in which it's productive, but there are ways that it isn't. And sometimes it causes us anxiety. The five types of, of identified um, addiction at this time are cybersexual addiction, which we know again is going back to the representation of the different types of bodies that, especially female uh, identified bodies, uh, are often um, part of that cybersexual world. Cyber relationship addiction, where people are constantly compulsive uh, with cyber relationships and not necessarily developing deep intimacy or connection. Net compulsions like gambling, shopping, trading, I'm gonna say gaming, because <laughs> I think that's my biggest addiction uh, when it comes to the internet world. Information overload, where we're compulsively web searching on topics and it's causing us anxiety and sometimes depression. And computer addiction, where we're constantly, well, that's game playing, which I was talking about earlier, which is um, where you're constantly playing games and you can't get off. Does the media control our lives then? Well, some would say it's become a work problem that we're constantly going to be working on um, in several arenas, including uh, social work problem and also psychology, as well as our information as sociologists. Office workers, for example, in a new study, spend one hour a day on non-work internet activities, which could cost businesses as much as $35 million per year. From a functionalist perspective, that would look like, you know, a problem. From a conflict for theirs, it might be freedom of choice to relax in this way. And why are people, you know, making that one hour something um, that is valued? And lots of countries, by the way, take several CS to breaks throughout a day. 
uh, and incorporate that into the norm of their work life. And um, then there are interactionist perspectives that would say, uh, you're probably on the computer that whole time <laughs> or doing some sort of automated work or your labor is something as to the point that when you're on the day with non-work internet activity, you might actually be making connections with people to uh, relax. And so there's a lot to criticize on that as well. And so uh, we need to look here, uh, this is a 2014 survey, sorry it's so old, but it's um, one that I, I found the most use at this point um, of what countries use the internet and I would imagine it would still land out at this but um, the top one is China of course the more people and they're more remote and we do know that cell phone usage has connected people in rural areas um, globally that may not have computers um, so we know that China has uh, always since the internet boom been growing in use European Union and United States right after that. Um, and so the European Union, you know, uh, since 2014 uh, included uh, the UK and still probably does, but soon that will probably change due to some population uh, change and shift there. Another thing we look at in the media is there's a current generation that their major form of the media for the longest time was the newspaper. Um, I remember growing up and my parents reading the newspaper thoroughly in the morning and then weekly uh, or no nightly with the derby paper that we grew up with and that has been the primary form of access for many people in the u.s and other parts of the world the print printing press uh, did change the world uh, as far as people getting access via print of several forms of media um, it was not just the newsletter, it was books, it was journals, it was posters, I mean, all of that kind of thing. But the newspaper itself, we've seen decline. A lot of it is moving online, so it's a form of a newspaper, in quotes. In 2000, there were 14 or 1,468 daily papers, um, or 2,000. <laughs> I think I could mess that up, sorry. In 2000, there were 1,468 daily papers. By 2014, there were 1,331. And I'm sure that it's declined since then. Um, the decline in print means there's less coverage of government in suburbs and remote cities, pulling back on the state and government coverage. You really have to search for your own local government. Uh, the discrimination of specialty beats like science and religion and fewer feature stories that are just your everyday good news stories, those things that you want to hear about that are from your down the street neighbor, um, which is causing maybe uh, some uh, sense of social distance within your own community. The other thing that we have to recognize is people are often checking their phones while they're driving. Uh, some wouldn't think that the media is a major part, but even just listening to it, driving distracted, hearing uh, different stories that get you fired up, but texting is one of the forms of media that um, we often are using. Now, I'm going to say when it comes to media and news, it's not what we're talking about there. It's media and connection. Most of the time you're texting with somebody you know, but we do put it into this category that the use of cell phones while driving has been attributed to at least 1.3 million traffic accidents. Uh, and since 2009, 47 states, that was, by the way, in 2019 or 2018. Since 2009, 47 states have enacted bans on texting while driving, and 38 states have enacted total cell phone bans for young drivers. So do you trust news media, or do you trust anything that has to do with a large um, conglomerate uh, or state uh, set of disseminating information for you? We know that it's waning in different ways, or maybe it's shifting, just people finding different ways in which they try to get at that work um, and try to get at trying to understand what's really going on in the wor world, which again is a form of labor. At this time, it's not necessarily fun. In 1985, 55% of those surveyed felt that the news media usually would get the facts right. I think that would be true based on, you know, the Walter Cronkites of the day that uh, people turned tuned into different things like 60 Minutes and we had three stations plus a public service station. Uh, so there was a sense of, of it not 
being something that you were constantly engaged in. 34% believe that the news organizations usually provided inaccurate reports. So people have always been skeptical as they should. It's their right to question where we get information. In 2011, 25% believed that the news media usually get their facts right. 66% believe that reports are often inaccurate. So that major flip in that short of time is uh, something to be said about how digital media has kind of played. President Trump, by the way, embraces the term fake news. And a lot of people have laughed because uh, they too think that the Trump administration pumps out fake news. Um, all camps hold on to this phrase <laughs> and it's not uh, owned by anyway, anybody, but that sense of those two uh, words being used by him did highlight a certain perspective owning um, that stamp and undermining public trust in the press. Social media also allows for greater creation and dissemination of misinformation, meaning you have a high probability of getting information that's being shifted quickly, asking you to click and share very quickly without checking it out. A couple things that we've done on the government side uh, to try to control that type of abuse uh, was the Federal Communications Commission Telecommunications Act of 1996. Um, and FCC, the FCC was, by the way, established in 1934, which correlates with high levels of the radio starting to become, it was the new, internet of the time and people having access to things like movie theaters where they would get newsreels and um, you started to see media becoming a part of the public sector and also coming from multiple uh, forms of uh, analog. And then FCC re regulated uh, interstate and international communications by radio, television, wire, satellite, and cable. Um, that's what their work has been since then. The Act of 1996 was the first major overhaul of that, which designed and encouraged competition. And I remember this in 96 when we had the major conglomerates basically being challenged because um, they, first of all, were making the most money off of the news, but they were also, uh, there was very little competition because of the, the uh, media being owned by basically three major corporations. Results, in fact, um, a lot of times are the opposite. Um, there, there's a lot of times where people looked at the 96 piece and then suddenly the competition came out and it may have broken down the monopolies, but then um, as economies changed, as we lost print publication, many of those conglomerates that broke off then suddenly started to get into other areas of the media, such as Fox um, on TV, um, we started seeing more documentaries from different uh, parts of the uh, uh, film industry that were sponsored by, you know, one of the major corporations that owned the media. Um, and we saw a lot of print publication go into the uh, uh, acquisition of these large former broken up monopolies. Of course, we saw other ones come to the forefront, but um, the competition is kind of a, a question mark right now. Who's watching? Facebook, Twitter executives often are looking into uh, all kinds of ways in which we've been hacked. Um, we hear this all the time, Russian linked accounts, uh, elections, attempted influence, of course, um, on how we think about politics based on trolling, all kinds of stuff like that. So when we talked earlier about your privacy and thinking about what you're putting out there as far as your impression, there's also this, it's not about NSA, it's, it's about uh, foreign spies in that aspect. And so it's important for us to recognize this is gonna be part of our life, it's a new norm. Numerous organizations monitor media, such as Accuracy in the Media, which is AIM, and Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting FAIR, are nonprofit grassroots organizations. Um, there's a project right now out there called Excellence in Journalism that journalists are signing up for that has a certain set of guidelines that people can trust. The final thing is that we all have had to learn a new literacy. And it's digital liter literacy. And how we disseminate what we're bringing in, sending out, all of that. So media education helps us mitigate, mitigate the ability to sift through, analyze, 
look at messages, entertain, uh, understand how we're entertained, understand how we buy into and, you know, what we will even uh, sell. You know, a lot of people make a lot of uh, money off of selling off of digital media sites. And also sometimes it supports their own media voice as we hear podcasts and other kinds of uh places that are backed by advertising. And um, then there's also sponsoring of what venue they will uh, share that podcast on, all kinds of ways in which that's shifted as well. Learning to move a passive receiver, by the way, to an active critical receiver is difficult, especially if people have early on um, basically bought into the concept of certain media uh, libraries and, and that's where they um, sit and they don't walk outside of that to consider other options. And that's all the way across the board, not just politically. Um, you know, if you are looking at mostly things that are reflective of who you are described as, like for example, I'm a white female, upper middle class, technically uh, educated person, I'm probably going to do a lot of NPR. <laughs> you know, I'm probably going to do a lot of BBC, those kinds of things, also being 50. Um, when I'm not looking at other sites and looking at their validation, other particular views, um, and not trying to label them, but just trying to sift through it, and keep that sociological imagination of the other, then I'm only involved in a certain kind of literacy that you know boosts up my self-image. So it's important for us to recognize. Digital literacy also involves the ability for us to use that digital tool, identify and be able to manage and evaluate, analyze and synthesize the digital resources. This is one reason a lot of times when I ask you to do a research paper, I want you to use sources that are primary, and I also want you to know how to look at that to see if it was uh, biased toward a particular uh, news uh, worthy top story type thing versus this is actual real reporting or research. And um, again, this is why I often ask for academic peer reviewed pieces and or primary source um, that has had lots of validation because it has had peer reviews within it to validate that it's true uh, scientific work. That is it. Yay. I hope that didn't break your brain and I hope you have a really good week and uh, I look forward to the discussion that we are going to hear from the other two groups that are sharing. Have a good one.